Hot weather expected for many folks to start off the week here across much of the cord belt. That's something we haven't seen a whole lot of here the last few weeks of summer. Joining us to talk about that and more, we welcome in our good friend Eric Stodgrass with Nutrient Ag Solutions here to walk us through this week's weather forecast. And Eric, as I mentioned, hot temperatures, a lot of 100 degree readings expected in parts of the Corn Belt here this week. And that's something we have not seen so far this summer for the most part, Eric. No, it's not. And uh, so, so what's really quite interesting about this is the big question of how, how long is it going to last? You know, are we just going to get four or five days of it? Because most of the crop, unless your crop is already very marginalized because of the, the lack of moisture, for example, uh, most of the crop is probably going to be able to handle a lot of this um, as long as it only lasts for five or seven days. Now, what's interesting about this is we do expect there to be storms out of this pattern. It's going to run over a ridge that's going to develop and kind of expand its way into the central United States. So this map here just shows the latest one week outlook. And what's important about it is you do see in the upper Midwest, the, the, the northern plains, who the, you know, the, the primary corn and soybean belt, there will be storms that roll through there. And I, I do have to caution everybody just to understand that this is the time of year where these thunderstorms are terribly predicted, but when they do come through, they do have the potential for producing straight line wind damage and hail. And by the way, um, we have, we're well above average on those numbers this year, the hail and wind damage and also tornadoes uh, for, for 2023 compared to historical averages. And it's kind of fun, Jesse, just thinking about this. This morning I went back and looked. The last time we've had a day where we didn't at least have a slight risk for severe storms by the Storm Prediction Center was June the 7th. Wow. Since June the 7th, every day has had at least a slight risk. And that's important to understand. Slight risk means there are going to be some nasty storms in there. But today is the first day we've not had that, uh, even though there is nasty storms coming through parts of western Iowa, Nebraska, northern uh, Missouri, and Kansas early this morning. But you just look at this map, and what you see here is ridge riders. That's going to be the thing to talk about. The ridge opens. It gets very hot in the central United States. We're going to start seeing that heat today. It's going to last all the way through Saturday and Sunday of this upcoming week. So that's a good five to seven days of upper 90s in many places like in Kansas, Missouri, Illinois, cracking 100 Fahrenheit. We could get 100 in, in Nebraska, Iowa, maybe even South Dakota and Southern Minnesota too. Mm -hmm. But it's the duration. And do we have storms that cool things off? Do we have storms that provide the water? And of course, we know that lately there have been a lot of storms in that area that have put some soil moisture in, which means we may be able to survive these high evaporation rates for a week. Well, and thinking about that, and we got to put this in perspective, just how cool things have been here over the last month or so. Right. Uh, talk about that and, and why the crop should be able to withstand a, a decent amount of this heat here this week, Eric. Yeah, we are way behind average on our stress degree unit. So this is a, a metric, I believe, coming up, uh, developed by Elwin Taylor out of Iowa State. He basically counted up uh, every heat unit above 86 Fahrenheit and said, if you get above about 140 of those units, then you're, you're going to run the risk of having some crop yield loss. Well, this map here we're looking at shows you the month of July. These aren't stress degree days. This is actually just rank. And if you look, much of the Midwest, the Central Plains, we've been well below average on temperatures. All the heat has been south. I mean, Texas has taken a beating with the heat. So has Oklahoma as of late. The Western United States, you know, it's been in the news a lot, some of the heat that's been out west. Well, this is all going to change in the next week. But I think that's about the duration of it. It's, it's about a week long of excessive heat. And then we start to see the pattern send in the ridge back to the Western United States again, which means it breaks down. We go back into seasonal summertime temperatures and storms. So um, this could have been a disaster if it mm -hmm. would have lasted longer, but I don't think it, uh, I don't think it has the legs on it to really cause major, major problems in the midsection of the country. Well, and Eric, I've been hearing some folks talking about we get into the month of August and things could uh, turn a, maybe a little bit wetter or at least temperatures moderate some. So let's talk three, four weeks out. What are you seeing here as we get into the bulk of August? Yeah, so the CPC has been the most aggressive on giving you the forecast you see here, and that is much of the central U.S. getting equal chances, which means they're not picking up on a strong signal of it being hot. Now, the southeast, the south, up the Intermountain West, yeah, there is better evidence of heat coming on in this pattern, but they were the first to kind of jump on this pattern, really giving us a kind of an El Nino-like flare. And El Nino has not been fully engaged in this pattern all spring or all summer. It's there, it's developing, but it's not been going on. And if you flip this over to the precip side of it, I mean, that looks like a pretty low risk scenario for a lot of places in the U.S., doesn't it? I mean, 
we don't see the heat lasting for days and weeks on end, and we start to see precip building back into the country. Now, of course, it is the time of year where wild, uh, the wild card is going to be uh, tropical systems, but you look at this and you say, all right, CPC, you've taken a bite out of the El Nino here saying that it's going to be the thing to chew on for much of this next month. And uh, we're waiting to see it fully engaged, but some of the other models are kind of trending toward what the CPC is saying. Certainly, I can make a lot of sense out of their forecast, but I will tell you, it is summer. This is going to be isolated storm events. This is not the scenario where everybody just gets dumped on with rain, but mm -hmm. it's one that kind of pulls the risk off, at least when you look farther into the future for a lot of people in the midsection of the country. Well, I know one thing you keep an eye on and a, a lot of folks do as well when it comes to these El Nino patterns and more is what's going on, sea surface temperatures, et cetera. Can you talk about uh, what you're kind of seeing there right now, Eric? Oh, yeah. This is a good map to spend a moment on here. Okay. El Nino, find South America, go straight across the equator over toward Australia, Indonesia. El Nino is growing. It's a degree C above average. It's five degrees C above average over there by uh, the, uh, the, the west coast of South America. The cold water coming off the Baja, that's two to three degrees Celsius below normal. That's part of the negative PMM. I don't like that. If we got rid of that, it would not stop storming in the midsection of the country. But the Atlantic has been very hot, a lot of heat in the ocean. Therefore, it's perfectly primed to make a big hurricane season should anything begin to form. But notice this, okay? Go right off the east coast of like Quebec, like Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, south of Greenland. In the last 10 days or so, those ocean temperatures went from below normal to now in some places up there, six, seven, eight degrees C above average. And it's all been because of a big high pressure cell, stagnant flow, no upwelling, lots of sunshine. And we, I don't know what to make of that yet. I, I can't tell you what that's going to do to our pattern, but that's a lot of hot ocean that just showed up here off of well, the, the East coast of North America. So just it's, it, I guess it's just to say is while we may see these longer range forecast maps and, and, and start to build confidence in them, I want to pull everybody's reins and just say, Hey, okay. The next couple of weeks, I feel confident about the Ridge where it's going to move, but seeing stuff like this shift around means that later the season, we still have too many pieces that are moving on the board to kind of settle this pattern into one way or the other going forward. So it's competition. El Nino needs to step up and win, but at this point, it's not yet done that. Eric, I want to ask you too, uh, the Canadian wildfire smoke. I know that's something that's been on a lot of people's minds here the last couple of weeks as it's impacted the U.S., are we going to see more impact from some of that wildfire smoke here the weeks ahead, do you think? Uh, not quite like we have seen. Now, it's been across the Midwest the last couple of days. We still have air quality alerts out for uh, parts of Minnesota and Wisconsin, I believe, this morning. But um, we've got better storms coming through British Columbia and Alberta. That's good. It's going to help put those fires out. And the fires that have been in Quebec have been kind of uh, reduced in their area. But now we're starting to think about, well, what happens to the West? If I keep telling you heat's going to the West, then do they start to have fires? They've already got a few that are in Oregon, one in Northern California that we need to keep an eye on. So that's going to be something to be in the lookout for. Um, we've got other international things too. I mean, mm -hmm. we've had serious heat in Europe that's now been replaced by colder weather. They've got major risk for severe storms rolling across Central Europe. China keeps flip-flopping back and forth in every forecast on if the rain's coming or not. The Indian monsoon came on in a big way. It's been super wet there. And finally, one place that's settled down a bit has been Australia. They're, they're actually starting to see El Nino-like, uh, you know, it's, remember, it's their winter, uh, El Nino-like winter conditions down there. So, yeah, there's all that's on the table. I'm just watching all of it right now. Well, we, of course, appreciate the time and insight into what is going on, not only here in the U.S., but around the world when it comes to our weather. Folks can sign up for Eric's weekly weather newsletter by uh, finding the links here underneath uh, our video or on our website. And also they can check it out and check out some of the latest uh, up-to-date data at ag-wx.com. Eric Stodgrass with Nutrient Ag Solutions. Always appreciate the time, my friend. Have an awesome week, and we'll talk to you next week. Sounds good. See ya.